Hi. I'm looking for my screen here. There it is. <laughs> my screen. <laughs> Mr. Lawson, good morning. Oh, great. Well, hopefully you've got your uh, liquid fuel. Uh, well, my liquid fuel is chocolate almond milk, and uh, I usually drink that straight out of the carton. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that on screen. Oh, so man. <laughs> is it uh, crazy foggy where you are? No, it's very sunny. I, at least I looked in my backyard and it was very sunny. Uh, I, what I've got up at about six and the whole time it has been uh, like a John Carpenter movie out the window. So like before we logged in, I went and like grabbed another <laughs> lamp and everything because I'm like, usually I get this great um, sun coming in the window so I don't look like such a zombie. <laughs> and uh, I was like, that's not happening today and I need some more coffee. So Oh man, well, well, you look, you look great. You look he uh, happy and healthy. So uh, I'm, I'm healthy. I just had my, uh, I just had my third uh, jab a few days ago. No side oh, oh, the vaccine. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, went. I went for a cocktail. I got uh, Moderna this time. So we were expecting there was going to be some side effects. There were. Oh, uh, what do they call that? Mixing the cocktail. I, I don't know, st sh shaken, but not stirred, injected, but not infused. <laughs> I, uh, so I got the two Modernas. I haven't gotten a third one yet. I think they said you officially have to wait um, six months. Yeah, I, I got mine. All of us here in the Van Nuys House of Poets, we all got our, um, uh, which is my house, uh, we all got our shots uh, six months ago. And each of us got a different one, uh, except for the house guest. The house guest and I, uh, Lenny, we both got Pfizer's. Lynn Bronstein got Moderna. <laughs> James Everett Jones got J and J. So we all we all got we all got our mixture. But this time around, Lynn and I went and got Moderna because that was available at, uh, around the corner. Yeah, and I heard that um, they kind of did away with the Johnson and Johnson, but then I. I've heard you can, like like you were saying, you can just do one of the other two and you're fine, so. Yeah, you should be, you should be okay. Although, although um, you can still, you can still get COVID. I have a friend who went to a Halloween party um, last weekend and uh, I think he had all three shots and he, and he picked it up. He picked up COVID. Um, not in bad shape. Medical condition, or he's in good. Sh he's in good shape. He's not going to the hospital or anything. But now he has to quarantine. Oh, uh, so. okay. I yeah, I had a, a family friend that uh, went through something similar, but it's because she she had like really you know bad pneumonia and it was kind of like compounded issues and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I'm I'm probably gonna knock out the third one here. Um, I, I can I can take it, but I think they're taking a lot of people that had the um, pre-existing medical right now in my area for my age group first. Um, but I think yeah. you can pretty much walk into like any CVS at this point. And just That's what we did. We went to CVS, and I I do have pre-existing medical, so I have to uh, I I do have to get it taken care of. But it's done now. And then next week we'll go and get our flu shots. <laughs> And uh, just hold out your arm for this, for this, for this. For and this. I'm also I'm right. also in a uh, vaccine study right now for uh, RSV, which is an um, upper respiratory virus that hits children and seniors. And I thought, well, what the heck? I'm available. I could use the extra money, so I signed up for it. And I actually feel kind of good to be on the. Um, the testing side of the battle because that way if they uh, if this proves to work then they'll have a nice little arsenal of things to help people not get sick and of course when you really get older then you have to have the pneumonia vaccine <laughs> the fun never ends I gotta say human just, sieves <laughs> I was just looking at your background and I think oh, the mess that is my office. No, 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 Welcome I to it. I was going to compliment because <laughs> I've seen other people that use the fake uh, Zoom backgrounds and try to have a background like that where it looks like 
you know, books and shelves, but I know that that's you and I know that that's real. So I'm so thankful that you did that because people try to get really wacky with those zoom backgrounds and like oh i'm in space and it looks like weird like a chroma key thing and then they're trying to hold up their book or their oh, cd hey, and like here the let me give you a tour hold on a second let me see if i can show you just how many books are in this office that's one wall over there that's the other wall wow and there are multiple bookshelves in this house Frank family has issues with books. We hang on to yeah, them. No, that's not an issue. In fact, my my bookcase that I just got a couple months ago is lonely because I've moved um, like three times in like the last four years. And so it's like I've given away books and sold things because you've moved in your life. You know that the easiest way to move is to... Um, what George Carlin said, just get the smallest version of your stuff because uh, moving. No such thing exists in my life. I've got there. I have, I have collections of all sorts of things. I mean, I've got toys, I've got cake pans from cake decorating. Uh, I've got my sci-fi geek collection. Uh, there's, there's no, small version of myself unless I could miniaturize my housemates here but which reminds me that a week from let's see what would the date be looking at the calendar there on the 13th of November that's a Saturday we will be having a yard sale here at the Van Nuys House of Poets nice people can contact me for the info All we're going right. to try to get rid of stuff not books but we're going to be getting rid of a lot of stuff just because there's too much stuff here. Keeping the cats, keeping the housemates. I'm telling you, it's all about the stuff. So um, tell me kind of what you've been working on in the last like two years. I know everybody's kind of been in this suck fest of a lockdown. Um, did suck you use fest. that time to do creative things or wrap things up that you didn't have time before? Or how did that go for you? Well, what you see behind you is wrapping up things I've been working on since 2001. Uh, this is uh, not an exaggeration. Uh, I had a large uh, die out of my family in the 2000s. Um, and uh, I kept downsizing family members and uh, two of them, we moved into this house. And um, I still have many of their things. Some of these stacks over here are family photos and documents that I have yet to digitize. There was 10 times as much stuff in this room before. So this is really, uh, this, this table behind me was covered. And um, in, in about, um, in about uh, a week, this table will be gone and we'll have free space. Uh, so I've been digitizing things. I've been trying to put things in order. I've been shredding. This is not exciting. Um, what have I been doing for two years? Well, uh, you know, I was working in the music industry for 15 years and uh, COVID killed the live concert industry. So I ended up getting laid off uh, last November um, I also, of course, look out after people's animals and nobody went anywhere. So that also died out for a while, but that's finally come back. Um, I started picking up more work editing and I worked on some books. I worked on a second edition of, of uh, Latvian poetry translations. Okay. Mind you, I don't read, speak, or write a lick of Latvian, but I... I was basically the, the poetry lion tamer on that one. Um, and uh, a football memoir, uh, I edited that. I don't know a thing about football, so I was really winging it. Um, I've been typing people's manuscripts, things like that, just to keep going. And, um, you know, doing some poetry readings on Zoom, uh, unfortunately, I've had to do too many memorials in the last two years. Um, most recently, uh, we lost Fred Dewey, the director, of, the former director of Beyond Baroque. So we had a 
big and very successfully attended memorial for him at Beyond Baroque Outdoors. Everybody was masked, um, but we had a wonderful turnout for that. I'd, I'd like to stop doing memorials. Now I've done three this month. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I don't want to do any more memorials. <laughs> Yeah, it gets tough and it, it's it's never ending. You know, I mean, I wish we were all uh, attending more um, weddings and uh, anniversaries than funerals. So I'm hoping that once everybody kind of gets vaccinated and um, I don't know if COVID will ever go away. It might be a, a thing that's always out there, you know, a possibility. But I think um, as more people get vaccinated, um, hopefully this trend will start to you know peter out and uh, hopefully we won't be hearing about it i think that unfortunately especially with people over 75 i feel like that kind of the generation just pretty much got obliterated in the last two years uh in a way i was kind of grateful that uh neither of my parents or their generation any of them all the siblings are gone they didn't have to see any of this i'm grateful they didn't have to see the last last six years of our country um that, that this grotesque parade passing by i think it would have been too stressful for them i'm relatively sure that um we could have kept the family safe in this house um, because none of my roommates nor I, we didn't get sick. You know, I found that following protocol really does help. Getting your uh, shots really does help. Um, <laughs> it's amazing, yeah. yeah not, not going out and getting swept up in a, you know, in a demonstration or a boat parade really does help. So, <laughs> so we, you know, but, um, and my parents were both uh, children of the Depression and the Second World War. So I miss having their perspective. They could have said, yeah, well, this was difficult. This part isn't difficult. That would have been reassuring. But what I was able to do instead was say to people, well, you know, my parents went through polio. Uh, my mother lost a brother, a younger brother to polio. And this is what it was like to be American and live through polio from the 30s to the 50s and um, and to reassure people because uh, pandemics is one of the areas, surprisingly, I never thought it would apply, that I like to read about. And so I actually know a few things about pandemics. I was involved in the AIDS project at the height of the uh, epidemic. And, um, you know, to have that experience under your belt and to be able to tell people, look, these things can last two years. They seem really scary. But if you listen to the doctors, um, you know, and if you're fortunate and you get a breakthrough like we did with the polio, the salt vaccine, then you're going to be OK. And so, uh, you know, another two years I spent was just trying to encourage people not to lose heart because um, they, they hadn't been through this before. They didn't know what um, they didn't know what a pandemic was like to them. A pandemic is something that happens on another continent and it's really exotic and they don't understand that these happen frequently. Mm -hmm. A big one happens every hundred years. And, um, you know, usually something like this surprisingly will affect everybody. I mean, after the Spanish flu, was um uh had petered out that was uh end of world war one right around 1918 or pretty so? much it pretty okay. much tweaked out world war one because they were dying of the flu on the battlefields well they um found researchers found uh spanish flu virus in the bodies of people living in alaska who weren't even touched by the war who weren't touched by the pandemic. It's just that a pandemic will work its way through the in, entire species, but not everybody dies from it. Just like with AIDS, there are a large number of people um, on the planet who have been exposed to AIDS, have antibodies to it, but never got sick. Right. And so we'll see that with COVID eventually. And what I wanted to touch on something that you brought up uh, about uh, keeping hope alive, I think that in certain respect with technology, we're very, very lucky. 
um, to be able to uh, do things like this, like Zoom chat and FaceTime and just cell phones in general that you can be somewhere and not home or in a park and take out your phone. And if you're feeling lonely and, and talk to somebody, you know, even long distance or, or just people you haven't talked to in six months and just catch up with them and say, hey, how's it going? What do you, what have you been up to? Do you have enough, you know, food? Do you have enough books or entertainment and to get you by? And how's your work situation? How's your car situation? Because um, you'd be, I mean, you probably know this from having gone through the last two years, but you'd be surprised that even people you don't talk to that often or um, people you haven't reached out to so much, they really do want that human contact they really we as people crave it mm -hmm. we're social beings by nature and i think that um one of the things i miss most about and i haven't done it for years open mics wasn't so much like something that i wrote or whatever it was more of like seeing the people that sense of community that sense of getting on stage and getting that instant reaction of like reading a, something i wrote like the other day like well, that line was craptacular and the audience let me know and I can't fucking wait to burn that shit to the ground. So, all right, these people are going to be honest with you because, you know, just reading something or recording something, um, you just don't get that human interaction. And I think that, thank goodness, we do live in this era where we have things like Zoom and we have phones and things like that because can you imagine if we were even in the Pony Express days, like writing letters to people. I mean, I miss getting letters in the mail, but like with somebody trying to give you good or bad news, <laughs> putting something in the mail on the West Coast and getting it to the East Coast and then getting their response. Uh, well, especially after the, you know, the uh, deliberate damage done to the U.S. postal system over the last year. Um, I mean, we're still we're still feeling that. Um, and that's not even taking into account the fact that we can't send packages abroad right now um, because all the ships are offshore. Um, I saw a great political cartoon the other day that that showed Black Friday as a bunch of people wading on wading into the ocean with rubber dinghies going out towards the ships <laughs> to see if they could do their shopping straight off of the ships uh, i feel like though that somewhere else in the world that would be normal uh yeah pa yeah <laughs> it's it is very strange though well we're going through we're going through all sorts of adjustments and and i don't think people were expecting that uh how bumpy it was going to be that it would be economically bumpy that we'd suddenly discover exactly what supply line means and we're not used to shortages we haven't really had shortages since the early 70s and i'm old enough to remember meat shortages gasoline shortages I remember gasoline shortages but yeah 73 was the first year that we started to experience um you know, started talking about OPEC and um, people don't realize that this is not the first time we've dealt with this since World War II, where the shortages were voluntary. Um, so it, while you were talking about, um, you know, that, that uh, craptastic uh, <laughs> poem, uh, should I share with you the nastiest line ever muttered at an Orange County open mic? Oh, please do let me put my cup down. <laughs> I wasn't there for it, but it has been, it is the comment that was heard around the world. Somebody got up and apparently gave a very wooden delivery of a very bad poem. And it went kind of long. So somewhere in the background, someone yelled, Shut the fuck up, you Teddy Ruxpin reciting motherfucker. <laughs> oh, that's uh, that's about right. Yeah. How, how would you like to be the poet who received that one? <laughs> I, uh, I wrote this thing, oh God, like 12, 15 years ago, one of my first uh, 
<laughs> at Sam's at an open mic, I think, uh, somewhere in LA, I can't remember. But it was like a deliberate knock at people that thought their stuff was so great, but then their delivery was awful. Uh -huh. and, so, and so the poem was called O Leaf, like just the, the, just the O, not the H, just the O Leaf with an exclamation point, like something going back like 150 years. And it was something like, <laughs> I didn't even do it with a straight face. It was like, O Leaf, how your swirling descent is a metaphor for my soul. <laughs> just because you've 10 minutes later and he's still going right you've been at so many readings in your life and you know that there's just some motherfucker that's gotta brag about being in the whatever new yorker or the atlantic or the um you know uh, paris review and they've got to say you know kind of like you should worship me because I'm in a periodical and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, you know, it doesn't mean I have to like your bullshit. Well, you know, Box City, are you familiar with Box City, that company that has, it's a chain store that has, uh, they sell boxes and shipping containers and things like that. And they put out a, uh, a monthly newsletter on bright, bright, bright yellow paper called uh, the Box City Buzz, and I have a poem in it. That's awesome. Yeah, company newsletters. You know, I, I, I would wear that with the badge of honor more than I would some of the more um, lofty uh, periodical titles. <laughs> I think that's great. I think that, that it's like any way you can get something out there that's kind of unconventional. Like I did a, an interview um, a couple months ago with um, uh, Kelsey uh, Ryan Swick and she does these things where she has like the poem kind of like almost like a piece of origami where it kind of opens up into uh -huh. the end and she'll, she'll sell those at her readings and you know, in addition to books and um, I told her I was so impressed by that. And then I said, conversely, like me, I just never think of doing stuff like that because I'm so impressed with myself that I can contort my brain and whatever into fucking like finishing something that doesn't suck ass. And so by the end of it, I'm just like, it's on paper and paper it shall stay. <laughs> You know. For, for non-poets watching this, poets do cuss and we do cuss while talking to one another. Now, if I do recite any poetry today, there's no cussing in it, but um, but yes, this is this is very normal. If we were like a, a party of poets, we would all be talking like this. <laughs> I miss Hopefully those parties. I miss I miss there. I'm, I miss those parties and I miss after parties. I miss things like uh, going to Denny's at three in the morning with a group of poets and just sitting around eating breakfast um, and, and talking about everything. Oh yeah, uh, back in the day when um, I'm originally from Ohio and I went to Kent State and I was in a comedy group there and we would do our shows at the university and then after we would all go and kind of like congregate at like a Denny's and just talked about like what worked and what didn't work and things mm -hmm. like that and sometimes we're still wearing like the crazy makeup and the crazy costumes and I miss like the uh the reaction getting from like the average people just like the hell are you guys doing you know <laughs> But in LA, I mean, the, the acting stuff I've done where I've gone with like the group of people like making a movie or something, you go into like a, a Denny's or, or some kind of like IHOP and people don't even bat an eye because they're just used to it. It's just normal. It's just normal LA people doing whatever. Well, I think that's the best part of living in Los Angeles or being in a poetry scene like Orange County because Orange County was very much like this in the 90s go and do an event and then afterwards we'd go and hang out or we'd, we'd go to a party and after the party was done we'd still want to hang out the thing is I've noticed about poets I think about artists is just we enjoy each other's company so much 
after the reading's over, we still want to keep being together. It's that high. It's that performance high and also the high of the connection mm -hmm. with the people that also do the same thing that I think that people go through that thing in their teens and maybe even in their 20s of like, I'm crazy, I'm crazy or I'm weird or I'm different than everybody. And then it's like you find your clique or your, your friend group or whatever that they're all minded, hive mind or whatever. Um, hive mind. <laughs> Yeah, those are for the Trekker fans. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you know what, though, it's like, because I got into, like I said, into the LA stuff only about 15 years ago um, with the open mics and everything. And even then, when there were, I compared to now, I feel like there were so many more venues. Um, you had um, Murray Thomas was still putting out the newsletter about all the events and um, that was our connective tissue, that newsletter, that next yeah, night. And I feel like, calendar. you know, internet is great it's because French. you can get the instant connection to people, but, um, you know, you know, people put out the Facebook invites and stuff, but I feel like that sense of community kind of went away. The more the internet kind of like took over as our like number one communicator and like event planning kind of thing. And, um, even in like 2006 or seven, when I was starting to do stuff in LA, um, even then people were nostalgic and talking to me about like the Onyx reading and um, God, what was the big one in Santa Monica? Uh, uh, well, there was the Hyper Poets in Santa Monica. There was Midnight Special. Midnight Special. Yeah, I was talking to Ellen maybe about that. It's like, even when I first met her and she was like, nostalgic about that and that's like well I think that that's a cyclical thing because I'm sure that um you guys when you were coming on the scene the first few times and going to the different venues and beyond baroque and everything you were listening to like people talk about going to see the beat poets and they're nostalgic about that so at first I was kind of depressed going like well shit did I miss the wave did I miss the ride did I miss um, the uh, the scene or something like that I is it just dwindling and dying and um, one of the things I've talked to uh, some of the poets that I've interviewed is that it's not that so much as it's just changing and it's always well, it, been, it always changes well yeah and it's always been um, a youth culture like youth centric especially around high school and college kids and those are the people that you know, if they're still living with their parents or their rent's really low and they're living in like a one bedroom, they have the time and the money and they don't have kids yet, or they can run around all over LA and Orange County and go to the different venues. Whereas the older you get, it's harder to kind of get out to more than one reading a month, you know? Well, I also think there was something uh, special about the time uh, of the 90s, because that's, I was, uh, my intake into the uh, community was 1990, when I joined the Iguana Cafe, and the Iguana Cafe had been going for a little bit before I joined it, and um, I met my core group of friends there, but the lovely thing about it was that core group kept expanding and expanding and expanding. As I said, Orange County, Orange County was a separate scene, but Orange County in LA decided we had a reading called Tearing Down the Curtain, the Orange Curtain, where uh, we went and had exchange readings and we became very tight and there was a lot of cross-pollination. And um, at the same time, my, my partner, Matthew Niblock, he and I started a magazine, Blue Satellite, and we started intaking new voices that were exciting to us. And it's just, to me, the scene kind of exploded. Then there was a core of the Onyx where you had the Karma Bums, um, you know, and you had, uh, you had a lot of people who also crossed into acting and performance art at that time. And you had it beyond Baroque, you had a scene where there were people like uh, Exine and Bob Flanagan and uh, Viggo Mortensen, they were all working out of there, but they were also cross pollinating with people like the Karma Bums. And they were also working out of the Iguana Cafe. But we just kept expanding the scene until up to the point where we had 
ties in the Inland Empire. We had ties up in San Luis Obispo, ties up in San Francisco, which um, San Francisco poets used to come down and read with us because they said, oh, you're so much more friendly uh, down here in LA. There are more opportunities for us to read and be seen by more people than we get in San Francisco, our own territory. And LA was just open to everybody. Um, the things that have changed it, I think, is part of it is economically, uh, it's become impossible for people to live in their own apartments. Um, it's it's what, uh, what poets could pull off with maybe two or three roommates now, I don't see how they could do it today. And uh, it's become, uh, while we do have much better public transportation and we have more venues and we still have, we, st we not only have Beyond Baroque, we have uh, 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 Tia, uh, Tia Chucha, we have- um, That's in the uh, Valley, right? Not in the Valley, well, yeah, we don't have the VCP. We only have the VCP online right now, but not as many in the Valley, but good Lord, we have the World Stage which is one of the most important venues, cultural venues of any kind in Los uh, Angeles. Yeah, I've been there, it's a great place too. Avenue 50, which we're going to read at tomorrow. We're doing a pandemic uh, anthology tomorrow, but it used to be uh, Java Gardens in uh, Orange County. Um, they used to have the Upchurch Brown bookstore. Um, the evaporation of indie book bookstores hurt, definitely, but, um, but the thing is, there's still exciting and explosive growth in poetry. It's become younger and it's become way more d diverse. And some of the things we're doing at Beyond Borough, because I'm still involved there in, in an advisory capacity, is um, we've talked about how Beyond Baroque definitely needs to serve all these different communities. And certainly that is a huge part of their mission, outreach to students outreach to as much eth ethnic diversity as possible, um, opportunities for as many people as possible, so that it's not an old guard of uh, people of a certain age and they're all Caucasian and they're all from a particular scene. It, it's like um, venues can't survive doing that anymore. No, and even when, um, I don't mean to cut you off there, but even when I was first starting out, I would notice that there was the really big division where I saw that um, they were what I would call younger people, with like high school, college age, up to like 22, maybe 25. And then there was this massive gulf between like what I would say 25 and like 50. Mm -hmm. It was like you had people that had been in the scene forever that were over 50 they were kind of the hosts and um, the people procuring the events and um, college professors running the presses and things like or the bookstores or the coffee shop readings. Um, but there was like nobody, not nobody, but from my perspective of like 25 to 50. And I see that um, in the last few years, that's changed a little bit. Um, and I don't know if it's just because for um, a lot of the younger people, like I was saying, it's so freaking expensive when gas is $5 a gallon to go to one more than one live reading a week or things like that. And so, I mean, there was times I used to be able to go to like three in a week. And I would think that was like no big deal because that was like what I wanted to do. And now it's like, God, I hope when things fully open, you know, next year that I, maybe I can go to like 10 total in the year well i think i think venues will come back i mean we've lost some venues just as we've lost uh landmarks and we've lost restaurants um you know some uh spaces that were much loved i mean think about uh musso and frank's the restaurant in hollywood you know what's kept that place alive is not only people doing um takeout orders but also their hardcore patrons just kept donating to the business to keep it alive. So it would be waiting for them when the pandemic opened. Poets don't have quite that much lucre to keep uh, venues alive. Beyond Baroque has been doing okay, but they've, they've had no live events until, uh, until two weeks ago. 
they've mm -hmm. got the bookstore, so that's uh, a revenue avenue. But um, one thing I do worry about, and unfortunately, from my perspective of being a parent, um, I like the um, availability of being able to order food and have it delivered with the different delivery services. But I know that those mom and pop restaurants and cafes that would normally host open mics. And what we're talking about here too is those delivery services are what's keeping them going. So there are less people physically going to the restaurants and cafes. So that means there's really no way that they could um, conceivably support doing an open mic because you don't have the people in the restaurant ordering the drinks or the food. Everyone's getting everything delivered to them, which I said, for me, it's, it's great. But on the other hand, it's like, okay, I can see why a lot of these places, um, even the newer restaurants and cafes, they're not going to do open mics. And one of the things um, I was talking about, um, sometimes the colleges will have these kind of combined deals with some of the cafes. And there's a great one in Riverside called, um, oh, geez, what the heck? Uh, back to the grind uh -huh. and the first time I went there I couldn't find it and I left like I found the cafe and I walked in and there was like six people in there and I'm like oh I guess I came on the wrong night and I asked the uh the guy behind the counter and he's like I don't know and I don't know right well he had no idea what I was talking about there was no sign no nothing no sandwich board or anything and so the second time I went like uh, two weeks later um I saw people going in with notebooks and I was like, okay, well, maybe they're here to study the university's right there or whatever. And I just, Hey, do you guys know where they're like, they're like, Shh, it's in the back in the basement. Like what? <laughs> like, I mean, we're not supposed to talk about fight club. What's going on here. And so we had to like go like through like this walkway and it was like this door and like, I had to knock on the door and someone had to let me in and like go down in this basement and they had a like a raised stage in the basement with a mic and a mixing board and you know uh, floodlights and everything so they had this whole thing now that's what we're talking about but it's like down and dirty old school like you know somebody who knows somebody who knows about a reading and I thought that's impressive because even when I went to that the first time like five or six years ago I thought even then with the internet flourishing and cell phones, like how, you know, and I think it was on Murray's list and I remember being pissed off at him. And I think I sent him an angry email, like you bastard. Like I went to this place and drove like an hour and a half and there was no thing. He was like, no, no, it's there, I swear. So, um, you know, I kind of felt like one of the Hardy boys, like, well, how that, where is this thing? So that was kind of cool. So you know things are out there and there will be new things popping up. So um, before I go too much on a tangent here, I'd like, um, if you could, um, for you to hop back in your way back machine, whether it's a DeLorean or whatever, and tell me kind of like, uh, I don't know if you're originally from LA or how you came to the area and kind of what kind of got you in the poetry and all that jazz. I am a third generation Angelino, um, so I was born here. Uh, the time machine would be a 97 um, Saturn station wagon, which I specifically bought in order to haul the poetry community, all its books and poets who didn't drive around. But I was born here, was raised in Los Angeles. Um, I'm from like the valley, you know, so, um, oh, uh, gosh, yeah. uh, I'd like, oh my God, I know, um, grew up here in the valley, uh, went to, went to UC Irvine, got my degree in English. Um, so I did study some poetry while I was there, got out of school, didn't write any poetry for 10 years. Um, but uh, in 1990, um, circumstances in my life demanded that I start doing two things. One, pet sitting, um, extra income in addition to my regular day job working at the movie studios. And secondly, I needed an outlet uh, for various things going on in my life. So I started writing poetry again 
and um, stumbled into the uh, workshop, the Sunday workshop at the Iguana Cafe. And uh, that, that is where I started meeting people and getting involved in the community. Um, in 94, started publishing um, our, our magazine, Blue Satellite, and our, our press, Sacred Beverage Press. Um, gave a lot of poets their first uh, publication credits, their first nominations for push cart prizes, their first books. And that sent me just all over the dang place. Um, and, uh, and I couldn't have done that without Matthew Niblock. He now goes by the name of Matthew Mars and focuses largely on music and art and photography. Uh, but make no mistake, he's one of the best poets you will ever meet. Phenomenal poet. We, we met and we just kind of knocked each other out and said, you're the one I want to work with. Um, what I want, yeah. Well, let me ask you, so I'm getting the, the, the history roll call, but um, what about poetry or certain writers when you were younger that kind of like drew you to it and made you think, I mean, if it, I don't know if it was songwriters or a book someone gave you or you came across it when you were younger saying, well, what's this? This is interesting. Well, um, when I was a little girl, I had a, I had a bunch of poetry books, books, as you've noticed, I have a lot of them. And I have most of my childhood books here with me. They're in a separate room. Um, but I had a lot of poetry bo books growing up, Child's Garden of Verses. There was the uh, Haunted House book, which I actually wrote an entire column about when I used to write an internet uh, poetry column. Uh, I would, uh, I mean, there, were, there was a lot I was exposed to that I enjoyed. But poetry didn't become something that really moved me until I hit adolescence. I started uh, reading feminist poetry when I was in junior high and high school. Um, they put me in a class for weird kids. Um, yes, that weird thing. kids. That was a thing? There was a weird kids class in junior high school. Um, it was the bright kids class, the gifted students, oh, but I okay. wasn't. I wasn't identified as gifted. And what that meant was when we went on outings, I had to pay for my outings and my classmates got it for free from the state. But we had textbooks that had uh, um, essays and uh, poems in adult language that would have cuss words in them. And we'd have uh, discussions about these poems. And a lot of them were feminist poems um, writings by people like Eldridge Cleaver, for example. And um, from there, when I went to college, I just became much more interested um, in alternative poetry. And I was also um, very involved in gay rights activism. So I would read a lot of uh, poetry and literature by gay authors, even though I'm not gay myself, I just identified with them being an outsider. Um, that outsider status, by the way, was uh, finally made clear to me when I turned 46 and uh, was officially diagnosed as autistic. And that sort of answered all the questions. Oh, that's why she's in the weird class. And that's why she's reading all the weird books and she's you know, hanging out with the kids who aren't like herself in college. I also lived in the art storm. Um, so, and we used to have uh, quarterly performances in my art storm and I'd read my poetry because nobody wanted to hear me sing. So I would read, uh, there's a picture of me on the cover of the Orange County, read, uh, the Orange County version of the LA Times, the OC section. There's a cover photo of me going like this. <laughs> and the photo caption says, Amelie Frank entertains with, of all things, her poetry. So- Oh my God, it looks like you're belting it to the back of the room. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, exactly. It was a really dumb looking picture, but it's like I looked like the kind of kid I was. I looked like a weird kid, but by then I was a weird 19 year old kid. Um, but um, so I would occasionally write poetry, but then I in the 80s uh, to help supplement my meager income, um, I started a, a company doing murder mysteries for parties 
Um, and that's, that's the writing I did for 10 years. And after I put that behind me, and after I had killed my last suspect, then, uh, then I turned to poetry. So, and my influences, I have a a large background in choral music, and I was a choral librarian. So I was exposed to a lot of text set to music. I actually did sing, and I actually did sing in, in a major opera production once believe it or not. Yeah. And so I learned about poetry from reading music scores. So I would find there would be um, E.E. E. Cummings and Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman, um, a lot of European romantic poets when you start uh, studying voice, individual voice. So you, you cannot be exposed to the music without being exposed to the text. And so by the time I entered the poetry community, I actually had an unusual entry in terms of the amount I'd read, but I'd read quite a bit. Nice, nice. So I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but I don't suppose you have any um, newer uh, poems sitting around within arm's reach that you'd like to share? If you have maybe two or three, maybe we can squeeze those in. I've got, um, I've got two I can read to you. Okay. Um, let me read the uh, funnier one first. How about that? Either way, fine, funny? yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, I wrote this last year. I have not been writing a lot recently, um, focused on other things. Um, this one just fell out of my head as if my head had a bunch of watercolor paints in it and it just spilled out my ears. Uh, this is for my friend Kent Perkins. Uh, Kent lives in Texas. He is the polar opposite of me in many, many ways, including politically. He's married to the actress Ruth Buzzy. Okay. But, but it is Kent and I who are friends. I don't know Ruth that well. And um, he's a big old Texan and he lives big like a Texan. And this poem is called um, Number 90 of 100 Things That I Love About America. And at the beginning, it goes, a warning. This poem was interrupted by a dog and I never finished it. It's because I was at work at Live Nation before I got laid off. They allow dogs in the office and this cute dog with a big bow in her hair came up to me and started tickling me with her nose and, and that the poem went away. So here we go. Breakfast, a celebrated meal effectively marketed but we do it so well in this country. It is not a lonely experience for even the eggs arrive in pairs or in triplicate. It is a meal shared in a booth with family, even one member will do, or an entire counter of strangers, their elbows propped level with the geometric squiggles in the googie formica. Their water glasses are replenished from iced pitchers that sing and plunk like heavy wind chimes. Good morning. Your newspaper is folded to the sports section or the op-ed page, folioed to make room for whatever plat bleu special you ordered to drop kick your day into gear. I have no idea what you were having for breakfast this morning, Kent, but I envision something with eggs because of their sunrise colors. Their doneness is always an option because we reside in a glorious land of choices. I also envision juice, tart, and agreeable a vitamin C tonic for those not shackled to statins. I visualize bacon or perhaps some steak to go with those eggs. Slices of sourdough arrayed like Midwestern states on a side plate, plate and jam, blackberry, sidebar. If I told you about the mysteries of American berries, the feral scents of those berries that poke up from the terra firma of our national parks could reveal, swear to God, Kent, it would scare the entire nation back into bomb shelters. Their GPS is pointed tentatively toward the expansive west and Area 51. And that's just the berries in your jam, Kent. We also have de rigueur coffee, heated in a way redolent of your surname, because one never knows if today's journey will take us to inspect 
oil derricks or some crime scene at the OK Corral. This is America. And in America, anything can happen. Anything can happen at breakfast, be it Eggs Benedict Ranch served by an oily James Dean fresh off the Little Riata, or the compare and contrast Huevos Rancheros, a dish favored by which I judge the restaurants from the Greyhound cafeterias. American diners are never replete with pasta, or excuse me, American diners are ever replete with possibilities. Now, you abide in Texas where barbecue, not a breakfast staple, is the benchmark for comparison, where the doggies do wop, smoke get in, gets in your eyes, and no one cares how high the corn grows, because nothing worthwhile happens north of Texas anyway. Where you start your day, you are always the tallest, blondest thing on the horizon, tall and tall, tall standing and tall seated, as you contemplate the merits of pancakes versus hash browns or corn versus flour tortillas. Breakfast is the repast of fuel foods, and you've got places to go. You recall that this is a land of tail fins, spurs, and roadside attractions, as close or as far away as any single tank of petrol can take you. As the gas station you will hit shortly, dinosaur jokes, excuse me, dinosaur juices bubble and pop, poor chimes, Peel off the notes A and C, and you can score a cherry Slurpee or a waxy ticket to a possible 25000 There is always so much potential in the phrase, where the day takes you, when you are the man about to hit the road America style. Right after breakfast, there are a hundred possible roads out of town, a thousand potential miles in any direction. Hearken, the Allen Ginsberg Hallelujah Chorus sings. Cornflower skies to smile upon you when you cruise with the top down. Cornflower beyond all eye span, the beaming sutra sun. Speed bumps cleverly disguised as 25 foot rattlesnakes. Hills as optimistic and as patient as desert tortoises. Kent, oh Kent, are you my angel? two octaves higher. Cactuses, the roadside flagmen stationed at the intervals of highway department markers to point out your postprandial destination. You pause and look to see where that choir went, but all you can discern are a million possible places for lunch, with or without car hop service. Whether you conjure Candy Clark or Ronnie Blakely to bring you your breakfast check, you can be assured of a companionable Lone Star smile. The elusive choir returns and encants. Okay, so Ronnie's from Nampa, not from Texas like Candy two octaves higher. Whatever, it's the smile that counts. It's all good. Check it out, Kent. In the booth next to yours, there's a five-year-old crayoning a Jasper Johns map of our continued contiguous wonder right here on the back of her disposable paper placemat. Perhaps this is real life. Perhaps this is an American Express commercial. Perhaps this is just the best day of your life. You're glad to have received the message. By the time you receive $2.37 in change at the register, don't neglect to pick up that silver and turquoise armadillo refrigerator magnet to bring home to Ruthie. Your coffee black with sugar has amped you out of your high calorie reverie and back toward the comfortable, the convertible du jour. You ignore the zeitgeist that scrambles to your heel from behind a snazzy white wall, its darted tail angling for an acute strike, because this is Kant's America. Everyone wears quality boots. Climb in, check the mirror, check the megawatt smile, check the black top for tumbleweeds, check the radio station for Nelson Riddle, encore une fois, choir. We interrupt this closure because your poet has just been assailed by a friendly economy-sized golden terrier mix, licking at her elbow, breaking the spell of your perfect breakfast, your perfect road trip. This poem goes the way of all Xanadus. You know the drill. Happy birthday, our country tis of thee. Wow, that was great. Yeah, Kent kind of liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Right on. You said you had another one? Yes, and it's uh, it's short. Okay. Very different mood. Very different mood. 
give me a second here. I have uh, I have trouble with my breathing. Uh, I've developed a uh, paralyzed uh, vocal cord uh, a few years ago, which is why I stumble sometimes. So okay. bear with me. No problem. The tempo is a little different. <clears throat> absence his second year of chemo and it begins with an excerpt from a poem by my friend Robert Chansey his poem is Queen of My Nights now she glistens morning and night a harvest in this parched land today a dream a rendezvous in an electric pond Neon rushes standing, Arda, Bada, Lazula, jutting unnaturally upright like streaked lightning growing from the slippery banks. And I wore that dress, an ultramarine reverie, with a grand heron in profile, her beak of glazed corn pointed to the one o'clock, strictly the AM, all aspects of this landscape sharp at attention, waiting for you to join me in the water, for your prize fighter's fingers to tear the lovely shift away from my body. Such a long time since you ripped those pearls from my clavicle, kissed my bones, angle, and body, reminded the lovely pinpoints that they were alive and connected to wings, and my arms so ready, it must be said again, so ready, so ready. Nice. Whew. Wow. Uh, well, that was a definitely a, a literary treat there. Um, yeah, your poetry changes when you fall in love. <laughs> it certainly it changes does. very radically when you fall in love. I think so. Um, well, as we uh, are going to wrap it up here, because it's been almost an hour, um, first wanted to um, get your take on um, if there's anything you'd like to offer to any of the younger people that are watching this that let's say that they're um, just getting into poetry or they're just getting ready to put out, you know, that first tentative chat book of their first, you know, 20 poems and maybe doing um, online readings and things and just kind of um, anything you'd like to say to them about um, sticking with it or just um, letting them know a little bit about, about your experience from that age and I'll let you uh, have at it for a couple of minutes here. Okay, kids, hi. <laughs> Here's the thing. Um, you have in you a throb, a natural pulse that is all your own. And you need to listen to that. Um, in me, it's come up in triplets. I say things in threes. And that's just the way I naturally developed my own poetry. But the most important thing you will ever do for your poetry, read, 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 and read read other people's stuff read a variety of stuff read the stuff old ladies have written read the stuff little children have written read the stuff written from other countries learn a second language read poetry in that second language my second language is french um you need to listen 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 more than you talk. You'll do your talking when you do your writing and you do your reciting. Um, take classes. The more you read, the more you will develop a good ear for poetry, an ear for good taste. You'll know when things are cliche. You'll know when words don't go together well. You'll know when they sound off key have a variety of teachers. I've had some great ones. I had Robert Peters. Um, I had uh, Charles Wright, who was both the Poet Laureate and a Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, take workshops from a variety of people. 
read as many books as you can get your hands on. And if you don't have a budget, I didn't go to the public library. I opened up a book of 10 Los Angeles poets just to get an idea of who's out there, what are they saying? Not only did I have my mind blown by the poetry that I read, those 10 people all became my personal friends over the years. I met them and I would say, but I read you in this anthology and I work with these people. These people are my peers and my mentors. Make friends, introduce poets to other poets, bring poets up. As you move up the ladder, bring new ones with you. Support one another. Don't backbite. Don't gossip. Don't call someone out as a Teddy Ruxpin reciting motherfucker. Have manners at the readings and you will be treated accordingly. Contribute more than you take and you will be surprised at how much you take away anyway. There are no lesser poets than you. There will always be greater poets than you, but you're going to learn. And over time, you're going to get good, okay? So keep confidence and develop that hum, that throb that says, I'm your inner voice, I'm your gut, I'm your inner ear, trust me. And it gets better with time, I promise you. And it's a lifelong discipline. Awesome. That was really heartwarming and informative. Um, so uh, we'll close things up here and I'll just ask if there are um, some websites and your personal social media where people can find your work or links to things like that and maybe any events or things that you've got coming up. <laughs> um, well, I'm reading it. I don't know if I'm reading it. Tia Ch uh, not not Tia Chucha, uh, Avenue 50 um saturday tomorrow i'll be there for the anthology reading i don't have a personal website but i do make two recommendation recommendations one poetry superhighway.com rick lupert he keeps the entire globe of poetry connected and he's been doing that since he was a youngin okay um you'll meet more new poets that way have opportunities to um, enter contests and to get books for free and all sorts of stuff. So Poetry Superhighway 2, join Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center, um, the best way to meet some of the greatest poets ever. And also uh, to access the books from the local small presses like Moontide Press, like um, Tebot Bach, like, um, uh, punk hostage uh red hen press you will pick them up there um support venues support the world stage you want you want to get you know you want to get taken to the woodshed on your poetry you go to the world stage and you, that's the place where you shut up and listen and let them teach you something um so and go find the venues and do as much cross-cultural exposure as possible. Um, I've never been big about promoting my own stuff. I've always been big about promoting community. Go to art galleries and concerts. Go hear your friends and support them. They'll come and support you in turn. Okay, if you wanna find me, um, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not on Twitter. I have an account, but I really don't pay attention to it because Twitter depresses me. And anywhere Billy Bob Thornton is, I am because I, I am his web presence. So if you try to contact his web presence, you'll, you'll find me behind it. So that's, that's kind of the way things are in my life. That's great. Well, um, I want to thank you for being on Make Your Own Fun. Oh, thank you. This has been so cool. Like I said, it's just conversational and sometimes people will read stuff or sing songs or whatever they feel like, but it's more important to just, you know, have that time to connect and reflect and talk about what the heck everybody's been doing for the last year. So thank you so much for being on the show. And, thank you for uh, having this platform.
platform and for being such yeah. a wonderful host. Uh, I, can, I can. Um, but I, I know you've got to run and I've got to run. So um, this will be up later today, which is Friday the 5th. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank Stay you. Good night, everybody in the house. And I'll talk to you later. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.